All right. All right, and the word is given. Thank you, Joshua. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Chuck Spence, the director of the uh, Procurement Technical Assistance Center, or PTAC. And we are pleased to welcome you this morning to uh, this webinar. And this uh, featured webinar is an overview of small business administration programs. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, PTAC's uh, regional manager, Mary Ann Flinders, for uh, sponsoring this uh, webinar for you. Uh, as you know, uh, Mary Ann uh, covers uh, the counties of Davis, Weber, and Morgan uh, in northern, uh, northern uh, Utah. So Mary Ann, thank you for uh, sponsoring this and for coordinating this. Today, our featured presenter is Mr. Brent Owens. Uh, I'm going, I won't introduce him. I'm going to let Mary Ann do that. But let me uh, tell everyone how uh, privileged and honored you are to have Brent uh, with us uh, this morning. I've known Brent for well over 15 years, and I can tell you from personal experience that Brent Owens is about as knowledgeable and as an expert on the subject of federal procurement as there is. Um, he's a former contracting officer with the, with the Air Force and now the uh, Procurement Center representative or PCR with the SBA. So we are privileged and honored to have him. And not only are we privileged to have him today, this might be his last webinar that he'll uh, do as, a, as an official representative of the SBA as Brent will be retiring after uh, many decades of uh, work in, 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 in federal government. And he'll be retiring at the end of the month. So Brent, we're going to miss you. We're gonna miss you in a number of ways. We're gonna miss uh, your, your, your experience, your, your knowledge, your passion, and your friendship. Uh, so thank you for doing this for PTAC today. Marianne, we'll turn it over to you to talk a little bit about PTAC and then sort of do an official introduction uh, of Brent. Okay, thank you, Chuck. As Chuck said, I'm Marianne Flinders, and many of you probably know me. I am the region manager, as he said, for Davis, Weber, and Morgan counties. And so we wanted to put this webinar on for you today and hopefully introduce you to small business administration services that you may not have been aware of or that you did not understand, and Brent's an excellent person to tell you about these services. So I'll take a little time, uh, first of all, to introduce you to PTAC, remind you and introduce you, reintroduce you, I guess, to the PTAC services that we provide, and then we'll move on to Brent's briefing. Next slide. So who is PTAC? PTAC actually stands for Procurement Technical <laughs> Assistance Center. PTACs are funded through cooperative agreements with the Defense Logistics Agency. And in Utah, our Governor's Office of Economic Development also provides funding to run our center. We provide free services to Utah businesses. We also have a teammate, their name is Logistics Specialties Incorporated, and they support us in some of our efforts that we do to help you as Utah small businesses grow and expand your business. We are a statewide program. We have offices in every county. As you can see, we support all these different counties. The offices aren't specifically in each county, but we do have offices that support each of these counties that are listed there. So do have statewide support. And I will give you some email um, addresses for these representatives that are in these offices in just a second. Next slide. So the PTAC mission we help businesses to successfully compete in the government marketplace, whether that be state, local, or federal government. We try to do that by providing knowledgeable and outstanding customer service to you. Next slide. And as I mentioned, PTAC provides free services. And these are examples of the types of free services that we provide. <clears throat> Individualized counseling, if you need help in putting together a bid or proposal, we can help you with that. We can give you suggestions and help look through your proposal, that type of thing. Um, we can help you with networking as far as helping you to meet someone at an agency that you're maybe trying to get into. We can help you find bid opportunities. We have a bid match system where we set up a keyword search profile on your company and we our database searches several different 
um, opportunity profiles. And if it finds a match for you, then you'll receive an email from us with those bid opportunities. We help you develop marketing strategies. And one of the most important things you need to ask yourself when you're working with a government agency is, do they buy what I sell? So we can help you determine that. We can also provide things like government agency historical buy information. We can provide specifications and standards and procurement histories. A lot of times manufacturers like that type <coughs> of information. We can help you develop a capability statement. We do a lot of training and education, such as the one we're doing today. We also have been doing a lot of training in the area of CMMC or cybersecurity training, which is brand new with the government, a new requirement. So PTAC has been working with that. We also do um, virtual webinars with the Defense Logistics Agency on their DIBS program and do training on that. We also recently in October had a <coughs> PTAC procurement opportunities presentation webinar. Generally, we have this in person. This is our big annual event, but because of the COVID situation, we held it virtually this year. That was a very successful event online for us. We also can help you with things like getting your DUNS number and registering in the system for award management, both of which are required if you're going to do business with the federal government. And just as a side note, DUNS numbers will be changing in the future to a unique entity identifier. That was supposed to happen in December, but that's been pushed out. I believe now they're projecting 2022 before that will happen. So that will be a little ways off still, but um, we will stay in the loop with that, be able to help you with that transition. We also help you work with different agencies and some examples of the types of agencies we've helped with are GSA, Department of Defense, DLA, Department of Interior and Veterans Administration amongst others. Next slide. And so I mentioned that I could give you email addresses for the different PTAC region representatives in the various counties. And as you can see there, We've listed out all of the different counties that these individuals will work with that they represent. And so you can find your PTAC representative there with their email address. And I'm sure they'd be happy to hear from you. So if you have questions, if you're an existing client or if you're someone new and you want to work with PTAC, then feel free to reach out to these individuals. Next slide. Okay, and that's the end of my little PTAC presentation. So now it's my honor and privilege to introduce you to Brent Owens. As Chuck mentioned, Brent is a Small Business Administration Procurement Center Rep, or PCR. I used to work at Hill Air Force Base in the Small Business Office, and Brent actually resided in that same office with us. He did not only just represent Hill Air Force Base, but he represented many other federal agencies in the states of Utah, Montana, and Wyoming. Brent has so many years of knowledge. He's been a great support of small business. He also has worked with the Air Force. He had 25 years as a manager, a contracting officer, and a buyer with the Air Force. And as Chuck mentioned, Brent will be leaving us shortly, so we hope he goes on to fulfill all of his fishing dreams and <laughs> the other things he'd like to do as he retires. And Brent, it's been an honor and a privilege to know you for all the years I've known you and worked with you. And appreciate all the professionalism, all the information you've provided, and also your friendship. I wish you the best as you move on into this new portion of your life. And thank you so much today for being here to help us with this webinar. With that, Brandon. You're welcome. <clears throat> well, thank you. <clears throat> Quite an introduction. Uh, me and Marianne also went to high school together. I've got to tell you That's that. Right. <laughs> she, she looks a lot younger than I, than I do at this point in our, in our lives. Um, yeah, it's a great honor for me to be able to participate uh, in this in this webinar with the PTAC. I've done this several times over the years, and I've always enjoyed our relationship. Uh, we certainly have a common goal, uh, being to help small businesses as they navigate through the, you know, the waters of uh, federal procurement, which can be quite confusing at times for small businesses, especially those just getting started. I'll go to the next slide. <clears throat> So today, I just want to kind of give you an overview of uh, who the SBA is, uh, what our programs are all about, and how they can assist small businesses. Um, next slide. 
And these are kind of the things I'm going to cover. Like again, just a small overview of who SBA is and then how do we assist small businesses that are prime contractors? What programs do we have to assist them in federal procurements? Um, and then what programs do we have to help small businesses who would prefer to be a subcontractor or who would like to get started as a subcontractor? And so we'll cover all those subsets as we go. And we've got a small group I can see on, on the screen here, those who are participating. So I'm open to questions at any time. Maybe after each slide, I'll just pause for a moment. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to field those at that time. Okay, next. Okay, the SBA, the Small Business Administration, we are an independent agency of the federal government. Marianne mentioned that my office was at Hill Air Force Base and I, I resided right with the Air Force Small Business Office. And so a lot of the people at Hill Air Force Base, especially a lot of the contracting officers, they were confused. Who is Brent Owens? And, and, and she, does he work for the Small Business Office at Hill Air Force Base? And the answer was no. I always had to explain to him, no, I'm a different federal agency. I just happen to reside at Hill Air Force Base, a, a tenant there, uh, because Hill Air Force Base is one of my biggest customers. But we are an independent agency of the federal government. We're not part of the Department of Defense or any other uh, federal agency. And of course, the, the goal is to a counsel assist the interest of small business. Congress, in their in their judgment, when they passed the Small Business Act back in the 1950s, realized that small businesses were the backbone of, of our economy. Uh, without the small businesses, our economy would really suffer. And so the SBA's established to help them to grow and be successful. We provide technical assistance, financial assistance, discovery, uh, excuse me, disaster recovery assistance. And then I've highlighted in red government contracting assistance because that's, that's my role. And that's what I'm gonna talk about primarily today. Um, we have different types of organizations uh, with different goals within the SBA. Uh, we have SBA district offices. Our district office here in Utah is in the federal building in Salt Lake City. They're on State Street and, and, and Third, uh, I think it's Third South. Um, Mar Marla Trollin's the district director there, and, and they have different responsibilities uh, than what I have. Uh, I work for the SBA government contracting office. Um, and I'm going to next screen, please. Um, the government contracting areas, there are six of those throughout the nation. You can see how they're split up there. I'm, I actually work for Area 5 government contracting, which takes in those states you can see there. And I have responsibility over Utah, Wyoming, and Montana. And uh, my, my actually, my area director actually resides in Texas. Okay, just for, for information. Okay, next. Next slide, thank you. Okay, so the basis for all of our small business programs, it's, it's the law. Uh, the Small Business Act uh, implements all of all the small business programs that I'm gonna talk to you about today. And it is the policy of the government to provide maximum practical opportunities in these acquisitions for small businesses at the prime and the subcontract level. So that, that's the goal. That's the policy that I've been trying to enforce with all the federal agencies that I work with for the last 15 years. It's the policy of the government to look at small business first before we start opening up competitions for larger businesses. And say, so what I'm gonna kind of go through today is how do, how, do we, how do we meet this goal? How do we meet this policy? Okay, next, next slide. Okay, we're gonna talk about prime contractor assistance first. Next slide, please. Okay, we do this in several ways. Uh, we have small business contracting goals. I'm gonna go through those. We have uh, small business set aside and direct award opportunities in our procurements. We have a procurement center representative or a PCR. That's, that's me and I'm gonna talk more about what my role and my responsibilities are and how I can assist small businesses and contracting officers. We have the certificate of competency program and the size program. These are two programs that are uh, they're enforced to help protect small business interests and, and protect the integrity of the small business programs that we have so no one's violating those and getting around the, the programs that are assigned to help small businesses. 
Okay, we'll go through each one of these a little bit in detail. Next slide. Okay, so the government uh, through the Small Business Act, so this is statutory, has established small business goals uh, for our procurements. Uh, th these, these goals that are listed here are the national goals, the federal goals overall for all federal agencies combined. Uh, they're just goals, they're not mandated by any means, but there are consequences for federal agencies that do not meet their goals. And you can see small businesses, the goal nationwide is 23%. Now that's 23% of all the federal contract dollars, not the federal, not the, not the number of actions or procurements, but the actual federal dollars that uh, should be going to small business. Uh, when you consider there's about $500 billion spent a year in contract dollars, that's a pretty good chunk of change that should be going to small businesses. Now, these other types of small businesses, the small disadvantaged business, the women-owned, the hub-zone, the service sale debt, they also have their goals. These are called socioeconomic categories. We'll talk more about those in a minute. Any questions on, on those? Okay, next slide. In addition to federal goals, there are goals established for uh, different contracting agencies, um, federal, uh, you know, different uh, departments of the government, and they have their own specific goals because uh, to, to establish an overall federal goal for everybody wouldn't be exactly right or fair because different agencies um, procure different types of things, different types of goods and services, and some are more small business friendly than others, and some are quite frankly not, uh, not a good position for a small business to be able to obtain any of those contract dollars. For example, at Hill Air Force Base, the Air Force Sustainment Center, the small business goal there is 48%. 48% uh, is uh, a lot higher than the, the federal goal of 23%. But on the other hand, there's another contracting activity out at Hill Air Force Base called the Nuclear Warfare Center. And their goal for small business is only 2%. And the reason being is there aren't a lot of small businesses that are uh, dealing with missiles and the new missile defense systems that uh, we're engaging in right now. Right now, Northrop Grumman has the contract probably for the next 30 years to implement the new missile system that's replacing the ICBM. So the goal of 2% is probably pretty high for that organization. They probably, my, in my experience the last few years, they haven't met that goal, even though it's only 2%. And then you can see the goals for like Army Dugway, um, Bureau of Reclamation, and Utah National Guard. These goals are all different. They're based upon their historical achievements and negotiated every year with, with the SBA based on what their projections are. So we take a look at all the categories and try to come up with realistic, but yet you know, goals that will stretch the, the organizations a little bit as well as we try to uh, maximize participation of small businesses, okay? So how do we go about achieving these goals? Well, let's talk about that. Any, any questions on, on, the, on these goals and how they're established? I might also add that, you know, we talked about them being only goals. Um, so people have asked me, well, what's the consequences of an agency not meeting their goals? Well, I can tell you one thing. Uh, it's, very, it's very political and uh, the administration doesn't matter which administration they're they're watching these goals very much they know they're important so agencies that aren't meeting their goals they get a report card every year from the sba and it's given to the administration and and, and they're tracking it they know which agencies are meeting their goals and which ones aren't and uh, the sba gets involved when companies when agencies are not meeting their goals the sba gets heavily involved and uh, we do more what we call surveillance reviews, where we go in and actually audit the, the, the contracting activities, small business policies, their, their goals, their achievements, and make recommendations. And we keep following up until they, they, they get on track and meet their goals. Also, all, all contracting officers are required to take small business classes to learn about the, the, the small business plans, the small business goals and programs and how they are to maximize participation of small business. Um, even some of the uh, performance reviews uh, that uh, contracting officers get and managers, uh, head of contracting activities, 
uh, their annual bonuses quite often are tied to an element that has to do with how well they're achieving their small business goals. So it's important and we do track them and, and, uh, and we've been doing quite well in the last few years, I might add. Okay, next. Uh, real quick, um, Jack asks, uh, does Hill Air Force Base typically meet their goals? Uh, actually, actually, we've been doing really well in meeting those goals lately. It's quite often, the, the, the two toughest goals to meet are the service disabled veteran owned small business goal and the hub zone goal. And it's always a quandary to me as why a, an Air Force Base can't meet their service disabled veteran owned small business goals. But quite as we'll get into, we'll talk about market research and, and how we, we determine the types of set asides we have. And that quite often gears towards uh, how we achieve the goals. But uh, uh, yes, yeah, so I would say for the most part, we, we're meeting our goals. There are several different contracting activities at Hill, not just the two I've mentioned here. There's probably about six or seven different ones. And uh, for the most part, most of them are meeting their goals in small business. Okay. Any other questions? Brent, I have a question. This is Brent Call at Richard Manufacturing. Um, mm -hmm. The, the uh, small business goals, do those just represent um, prime contracting or does it also represent um, subcontracting? For example, Northrop Grumman, um, I know they have a subcontracting small business plan. Uh, so I'm wondering if mm -hmm. those goals just represent prime contracting uh, actions or subcontracting actions as well. That's a good question. I should have covered that. No, these are prime contract goals only and achievements. Uh, the subcontracting um, achievements are not rolled up into the prime contracting goal achievements. Um, we track those a little differently. And I'll get into that in, in, uh, towards the end of this presentation. But these are just prime contract goals and achievements only. Thank you. Okay. Okay, next. Okay, so how do, we, how do we encourage those goals to be met and to maximize participation? Well, there's several things that we can do and, and SBA assist is the SBA the Small Business Act and the SBA uh, help provide for that assistance. Um, we have what we call small business set-asides. So in, it, whenever a procurement goes out on the street for bid, it'll, it'll tell you on the, on the face of the procurement, is this a, a procurement that is full and open competition, meaning is it, it's unrestricted, anybody can bid on it, or is it restricted in some way to only certain types of companies? And if it is restricted, we call these uh, set-asides. So for example, we have what's called a small business set-aside, the general small business set-aside that all types of small businesses can compete on this type of procurement. So it's, 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 it's only, um, open to all types of small businesses. And determining whether or not you are a small business is based on the size standard that is identified on that procurement. Uh, it'll be identified by a, a NAICS code and a, a corresponding size standard. And if your company qualifies as a small business under those standards, then you're eligible to compete for that, that specific procurement. We also have procurements that are set aside only for companies that qualify as a hub zone, or we might have competitions that are set aside for just 8A companies. Those are in the 8A program or the service disabled veteran owned small business or a woman owned or economically disadvantaged woman owned small business. So these set asides allow small businesses to compete without having to worry about their large business uh, companies down the street that uh, have you know, tremendous resources that they can't compete against. It's just set aside just for the small businesses. Okay, next. Okay, and here's how we kind of determine which ones of those procurements can be set aside or should be set aside. You've probably heard of what we call the rule of two. And basically that means that, uh, well, I'll get into that. First of all, any procurement under $250,000, we start at 10,000, that's considered the micro purchase threshold. Anything below that's pretty much open for anybody, but above 10,000 up to the micro, up to the simplified acquisition threshold currently at 250,000, all procurements are automatically reserved exclusively for small business. 
but there's always, you know, an exception. If, if they if they can't find small businesses that can uh, meet the requirement, then the contracting officers, if they can justify it, they can they can uh, util utilize a procurement that's not a set aside. Um, the rule of two is described in the next one, over 250,000, but it also applies under the 250 as well. Um, it should be set aside if there is a reasonable, and key, that's the key word, a reasonable expectation that uh, there'll be offers obtained from at least two responsible small businesses that can meet the, re could meet the requirement and meet it at a fair and reasonable price. Um, reasonable is, is important, reasonable expectation, doesn't mean there has to be a, a slam dunk expectation that only small businesses can participate. If a contracting officer can determine there's a reasonable expectation, uh, that's the threshold. It's not a real high threshold. It's just a reasonable expectation. Uh, uh, that, that, that's the key. And then I wanna talk about what, what it means to be a responsible small business. That's the next, first of all, any questions on that before I move on? Okay, next, next slide. So a responsible contractor, by far, and if you wanna look this up, it's in FAR part nine. To be a responsible contractor, you have to have adequate financial resources to perform on the contract. Uh, you must be able to comply with the delivery schedule. You must have a satisfactory past performance and you must have integrity uh, you must have technical skills and experience to perform. You must have the necessary equipment to perform. And you must comply with what we call the limitations on subcontracting. Now, you'll notice there's the asterisk by several of those bullets or the ability to obtain. So when, when a contracting officer is trying to determine whether or not a, a contractor is responsible and do they have adequate financial resources or do they have do they have the necessary technical skills and experience? Do they have the necessary equipment to perform on this specific procurement? They have to also consider, well, if they don't have it right now, do they have the ability to obtain it before contract performance starts? So quite often, a small business might not be in the position to say, I've got all the necessary equipment to do this requirement. But if I got the contract, I would certainly go out and acquire that equipment and then I could be able to perform. Same thing with technical skills. Uh, they could hire people to, to perform. If they, if they had the contract, they would go out and hire them. If they don't have the contract, they don't need those people at the time, they wouldn't hire them. Adequate financial resources. They may not have their financial resources now, but if they can show that they could obtain them before contract performance, they could get a, a line of credit, they can get a loan, they could get their bonding increased. They could do a joint venture with another company and, and combine their resources. All those types of things have to be considered when determining, is this contractor responsible? And now do we have a reasonable expectation that we have two responsible contractors? So those are the, those are the things we're looking for. And I'll talk more about my role in a minute, but I look for those things as well when I'm reviewing the decisions of contracting officers. Okay, any questions there? Okay, next slide. The limitations on subcontracting is one I, I felt like I needed to explain a little bit. That's one of the elements of, of a responsible contractor. Basically, that's just saying that if you are a, a prime contractor and you're a small business and we're doing a small business set aside, uh, the government don't, doesn't want you just to be a, a figurehead or a, a pass through for a large business in order to get the contract. So there's a there's a clause in every contract that's set aside, it's called the limitations on subcontracting, that limits the amount the prime contractor can pay to subcontractors that are not considered similarly situated entities. And a similarly situated entity is a subcontractor that has the same small business status as the prime contractor. <clears throat> For example, if you were a woman owned small business, and you had a woman-owned small business set aside. Now, the prime contractor is a woman-owned set aside, but if she were to also subcontract to another woman-owned small business, 
that other subcontractor would be considered a similarly situated entity and wouldn't count against their percentages. So you can see the percentage for services 50, supplies 50, general construction, uh, only 15% prime contractor and similarly situated entity has to perform. And with special, special trade construction, it's only 25%. 75% can be subcontracted out. <clears throat> Sorry, any questions there? <clears throat> okay, next slide. <clears throat> okay, so how does the government go about determining which, you know, these? I told you there was different types of set-asides, general set-aside or any of the socioeconomic categories. So a question I often get is, well, how does, how does the government decide which one of those types of set-asides do they choose? I mean, is it by regulation? Is it just by rotating, uh, changing it up? Is it by contracting offer preference or is there other, you know, is what, how, how is this determined? Okay, next slide, I'll answer that. <clears throat> okay, so really it comes down to the contracting officer does have discretion, but that discretion has to be based on certain factors and it's up for um, review by the procurement center representative, which is me, to determine whether or not that decision is, has been made wisely and with the with the pro proper discretion things that the contracting officer must look at in determining what type of set aside they have to first of all look at the procurement history um, certain procurements for example well, just let me give you an example the, 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 the best one if uh, you have a recurring service requirement that's been performed by an 8a contractor under the 8a small business development program, business development program. And this is a recurring service, so basically the same contracts coming up for bid again. <clears throat> Those types of procurements must stay in the 8A program. They don't have to stay necessarily with the same 8A contractor, but they have to stay in the 8A program. So once 8A, it's generally always 8A unless the SBA releases it from the 8A program. <clears throat> And then market search, the re results of the market research is generally what will drive the acquisition type. So when a contracting officer, before they determine which type of set aside they're going to do or what type of procurement they're going to do, they have to do extensive market research. Market research, which is comparable or to, to the size and complexity of the procurement that they're getting ready to, to issue. And they're looking for what types of businesses can actually do the work, which kind of businesses are interested in doing the work. They have to take into effect that rule of two and all the elements there that we talked about previously. And then the last thing <clears throat> they have to look at is, okay, uh, how are we as an agency doing in meeting our small business goals? Remember, we've got these, I showed you that slide that each agency has their own small business goals. Well, if everything else is equal, they've got multiple small businesses that can do the requirement. Um, they've got several, let's just say, for example, they have several hub zones and service disabled vets and women owned and 8A companies. They can all meet the requirement. They're all showing interest. So there's a good pool of companies. They obviously need to do some type of set aside. So now how do they decide which one? Well, the next thing they would do is they would look at where aren't we meeting our goals? Which, which of those categories are we not meeting our goals in? And that's, that should drive which type of set aside they have. Now, there are some, some rules, and I'm going to get into that a little bit more in detail in the next slide, but the socioeconomic categories, the hub zone, the service disabled vet, the women owned, and the small disadvantaged business or 8A type of um, uh, companies, those types of uh, acquisitions must be considered first uh, before a general small business set aside. So they do have a higher priority than a general small business set aside. In addition, if you can't, if the contracting officer can't determine that there are two or more small businesses in one of those socioeconomic categories, they have to look at and say, is there one, is there one service disabled vet that can meet the requirement? Out of all the service disabled vets, is there just one that can do it? If there is, they must consider that as a, a direct source or a sole source to that socioeconomic category before considering a, a general small business set aside, okay? Any questions on that? I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail in, in the next slide. Okay, let's go to the next one. 
Okay, so this is just kind of a um, overall flow chart. There are some exceptions to this on how to consider which set of sites. So if it's over 250K, the first consideration it would be a set aside into one of the socioeconomic categories. Now this isn't exactly uh, correct because under the 8A program, you have certain thresholds that you must go direct source or sole source as opposed to competing. It's like $7 million for manufacturing. We'll get into that and, and $4.5 million for services. But generally speaking, the first consideration to be looking for a set aside possibility in one of the socioeconomic categories. The second consideration would be to go a sole source in one of those categories. The third consideration would be a small business set aside where all small businesses can participate. The last consideration, if there aren't any small businesses, there aren't, the rule of two cannot be met, uh, then would be to be, uh, do an unrestricted competition, full and open, where all businesses, large and small, can compete. And then I guess I should say the very last consideration would be a sole source situation to a large business, which happens quite often actually. Okay, any questions on, on this? Okay, next slide. I mentioned that we can go direct source to some of the socioeconomic categories. I wanted to just highlight when that's possible because it's not always possible. Uh, under the 8A program, this is a very unique program because it's a business development program. It has special privileges that none of the other programs really have. I've, I say it's 8A sole source, but it could also be considered a direct source because sometimes there's more than one 8A company that can meet the requirement but the contracting agency can actually just select the source they would prefer. So it's kind of a direct source rather than a sole source in a lot of situations. In order to do a sole source or direct source, uh, the company first of all has to be a small business by the NIGS code. The, the competitive threshold for 8A is $7.5 million for manufacturing and $4.5 million for services. So if it's under that, uh, it can go sole source. If it's over that, it can also go sole source if the rule of two cannot be met, or if it's a ANC or Indian tribe, tribally owned company, and then they can they can go over that threshold for direct source. They must be a responsible contractor, uh, and a contracting officer must be able to negotiate a fair and reasonable price. If they can do that, it's considered you can you can go sole source eight A. Now, in the in the blue block below, it says 8A is not, it, excuse me, is a, a business development program, and therefore they can make a direct award without any ad, additional justification and approvals. Other socioeconomic categories, as I'll get into in a minute, must have a what we call a justification approval or a JNA document assigned at appropriate levels within the contracting office to be able to justify that in fact that company is a sole source. And the thresholds for not requiring a JNA are 25 million and 100 million for the DOD actually now, this past recently last year. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> okay, for women owned small business or economically dis disadvantaged women owned small business, there is sole source opportunities. Um, basically, it's the same type of flow ch chart with the th same thresholds. The key is if um, it's not a business development program and it's not like the ADA program. So there's no statute authority, authority to make a direct award. Agencies actually have to justify that there is only one woman owned small business that can meet the requirement. And if they can do that and get it approved there through their JNA process, they can go direct source, sole source to a woman owned small business. Now, you have to consider that this is a, quite an advantage though, because when you're looking at sole source opportunities where a company, where, where a contracting officer wants to go sole source to a company, in this situation, they only have to consider all of the small, all the women owned small businesses in the pool. Is there only one women owned small business in the pool of all women owned small businesses that can meet your requirement? If they can show that through their market research, if that's the case, then they can go a direct source to that one women owned small business. They don't have to consider other small businesses that could meet the requirement. They only have to consider the pool of women-owned small businesses. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, next. 
Okay, the service disabled veteran owned small business sole source program is, is the same, very, very similar to women owned. Again, if they can justify there's only one service disabled vet owned company that can meet the requirement out of the pool of all service disabled vet companies, then it can be sole source to that company. Okay, next. Hub zones the same way, same process. There's only one hub zone that can meet your requirement out of the pool of hub zones. It can be sole source to that company. Okay, next. And then just to, just to review, there's the considerations again. First consideration is um, a set aside. Second consideration is sole source. And third consideration is small business set aside. And the last consideration is full and open. Okay. Next. Something to, for small businesses to remember. Um, small businesses can form joint ventures and their, their, their status as a socioeconomic category does not change when they form a joint venture. They can form a joint venture with another small business or with an SBA approved mentor that's been approved under the Mentor Protege Program and they can still qualify for the set aside programs and the sole source programs under each of the socioeconomic different set aside or sole source programs. The joint venture must qualify as a small business, which means all the members of the joint venture uh, must be small businesses unless they have a large business mentor that's been approved through the mentor protege program. And then the contents of each joint venture agreement are, are specific to the type of uh, program. But uh, yeah, this is something that's very valuable to small businesses if they, if they don't think they can qualify on their own by joint venturing with other small businesses or even some cases a large business, they can still participate in these set-asides, influence them for set-asides or sole source. Okay, any questions there? Okay, next slide. Okay, um, so the question I put, pose here, how can small businesses influence the type of acquisition. So are small businesses, are they just at the mercy of the contracting officer in determining what type of acquisition is going to be issued to the public? Uh, the answer is no. Um, market research is the key. Like I said, that drives the type of acquisition in most cases. And so small businesses should be proactive in that market research uh, phase. Uh, especially if they see an acquisition that they want to go after, they need to be very um, vocal, if you will. Uh, they need to put forth their best foot in showing that they can qualify for that. They have the means to do it to help influence the acquisition to be a set aside. Some of the suggestions I put on there is make sure your your SAM and your dynamic small business uh, source system is is databases are up 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 to date. On some of the smaller acquisitions, and I'm, I'm saying usually those under the simplified acquisition threshold, uh, the market research the contracting officer is required to do is not as, as extensive, obviously, as, as for a larger procurement. So sometimes all a, a contracting officer will do is they will look in SAM, they will look in the dynamic small business search uh, system, they'll search by a, a, a next code or a keyword and find out what small businesses qualify. And so if your full description is not up to date, if you don't have those key bullets, those key words that might be, you know, highlight what you can do, you might be overlooked. You might not even be considered. You might not even see that there's a requirement out there um, that you're looking for, or the contracting officer might not see that you're interested in a requirement you, you might be inter interested for. Um, make sure you're, you have a really good descriptive website. That's another means of how contracting officers are searching. If they, if they see you in the, the SAM database, um, but they want to know more about you, they'll go to your website. They'll try to go to your website and see if they can get more details about you. So those are important. Um, those are being looked at by contracting officers. Uh, one of the key ones is quite often on the larger procurements, contracting officers will uh, well, they'll do informal market research, and they'll do that by sending out uh, notices in in beta.sam. Uh, they're called uh, sources synopsises or requests for information. 
they're actually going out, they're, they're trying to identify companies who can meet their requirement, who are interested in the requirement, and they're trying and they want to know what, what socioeconomic category the companies are in. Uh, you need to respond to those if you're interested. Uh, don't just assume that, well, yeah, I'll, I will actually respond when there's a formal solicitation issued. Uh, if you want to limit the competition to just small businesses, you need to respond to those. Um, explain the responsibility or the ability to obtain a uh, facet of your company. If you're interested in it and you, and you don't quite have the capabilities at this time, explain in your responses to these RFIs and these sources sites that you're interested and here's how I'm going to be qualified by the time this requirement goes out on the street and by the time we have to start performing. Um, I've asked, actually advised small businesses that they should, they should identify their small business competitors to the government. That might seem a little bit odd at, at first take, but it's really not. Um, would you rather compete against your small business competitors or would you rather compete with against your small business competitors and all the large businesses out there? Obviously, you only want to compete against a smaller pool. So if you know you're qualified and you know there's other small businesses that are qualified, there's nothing wrong with identifying those to the government when you're responding to the to the sources side or the RFIs. I've actually attended uh, pre-solicitation notices or industry days on large procurements where there's a, a pool of small businesses there and they know that they're not gonna, uh, you know, they're, they're up there, they're there with all the large businesses. I've actually seen the small businesses have break off meetings of their own where they get together and they strategize how they can joint venture together or how they can work together to become, um, you know, a big enough pool that they could influence the requirement to be a set aside as opposed to a full and open competition. And then, of course, they give that information to the contracting officer. Something to consider is the Small Business Administration Mentor Protege Program and forming joint ventures. This is a program that allows um, small businesses to team up with a large business with a lot more capabilities and still, still submit a proposal as a small business. So when you're responding to a source of SOT or an RFI during the market research phase, you need to let the, con the government, the contracting officer, know that you're in the process of forming a joint venture with a, with a large business. Here's how you're going to do it. That will go a long ways towards influencing if that requirement can go as a set aside or not. And then the last bullet on there, when you're responding to a contracting officer about whether or not you're qualified or not, or you're interested in the procurement, always copy the SBA's procurement center representative, which is me in, in, the, in the case of procurements that are going out of my areas, Utah, Wyoming, and, and um, Montana. And also the agency, every agency has a small business specialist assigned to a procurement. It doesn't hurt to copy the PCR and the small business specialist. That way they're put on notice that you as a small business are interested in that. And they will make sure that when they review the market research report that must be reviewed by them, submitted to them by the contracting officer before a decision is made, that they, they're aware that you're out there. And make sure that, that your interest is made known in that market research report. Any questions or comments on this, on this slide? Alex has a question. Um, who should initiate a sole source process? Should that be the contracting officer or the qualified socioeconomic small business? What are the appropriate steps? Okay, uh, it's just kind of uh, what, what I mentioned here. When you when you see a, requir a requirement you're interested in, and it's only in the market research phase, for example, it might be a draft RFP or it might just be a source of SOT. If you, if you think it should be a sole source, if you think you're the only source that's qualified in your socioeconomic category, you certainly want to highlight that when you respond to the contracting officer. That way, the, and, and like I say, copy the SBA PCR so that I know that as well. So like say you're a woman-owned small business and there's an advertisement out there in the market research phase for a requirement you, they're, you're interested in and you know that you have a niche in that area and you don't think there are any other women-owned small businesses that can do that, you need to highlight that when you respond to the, to the, to the contracting officer. And if the SBA knows it as well, like I said, when they're considering what type of set aside and what's the pecking order, 
you know, that's right up there on one of the top picking orders. That's the second one, you know, sole source to associate outcome on the category. The ultimate decision will be made by the contracting officer, but only after all these other things have been considered and looked at and concurred with by the SBA. Does that, does that help answer the question? I think so. Thanks. All right, next slide. <clears throat> okay, now this is me, the SBA um, Procurement Center representative. My role is to advocate on, on behalf of small businesses to make sure they get that fair share of that $500 billion worth of contracts. I work very closely with all the contracting officers in my area. Uh, I review their market research for every acquisition before it can be um, sent, out, sent out for official solicitation. I have to agree on the type of set aside or sole source or unrestricted acquisition that goes out. And so, uh, you know, if I don't know about you and your qualifications and you haven't, and, and the contracting officer doesn't know about you, then, you know, I, I don't have that leverage uh, to go back to the contracting officer and say, no, this should be a set aside. But I do review the, view the market research and hopefully that has been influenced by small businesses wherever they can. Now, I have what's called um, appeal rights. If I'm reviewing an acquisition that's getting ready to go out, I've reviewed the market research the contracting officer has done, he or she has done, and they want, let's say, for example, they want to go full and open competition. They don't think there are two or more small businesses that can meet the requirement. I will look at that and, and determine whether or not I agree with that based on what their market research is or any additional market research that I might do on myself. And if I don't agree with that, then I can appeal their decision to go full and open competition. And that appeal basically means I go to the head of the contracting activity and we, uh, we have that discussion there and make a decision there. And if it can't be made there, if we can't agree on it there, it gets appealed to the SBA administrator and to the agency secretary of the whatever agency it is. And in the meantime, the whole procurement process comes to a stop um, until that's resolved. So, you know, if I invoke my appeal rights, the whole procurement process stops. So most contracting officers, they know what I'm looking for. They know what, what I require from them. I require adequate market research to justify their position. Otherwise the whole thing's gonna come to a stop until it gets resolved. Okay. SBA PCR, such as myself, we, we, every year we go out and do what we call surveillance reviews on contracting activities. A team of PCRs led by a, a lead PCR team, team lead will go out and review acquisitions, review the contracts, the, all the market research from a contracting activity for the, for the last five years and see if, if they're really trying to maximize participation of small business. And if they're not, we come back every year until they do and we write them up or we give them suggestions and, and uh, that gets elevated to their higher management as well. Uh, we also do training such as this to not only uh, contractors, but I also do a lot of training to contracting officers to advise them on, on the Small Business Act and what their roles and responsibilities are. Um, you can always locate who the PCR is for an area by going to the website that I've identified there. Like they mentioned, I'm retiring at the end of this month and someone, someone will be coming in to take my place. That person hasn't been identified yet, um, but it will be soon. And uh, you can always go to this website if, you, if you're not sure. If you're looking for a procurement in, in, outside of one of the states that I, I represent, you can go to this website and you can find out who that person is and, and make sure you engage them in your responses with the contracting officer that, you know, to help you as well, okay? Okay, next slide. Okay, so another program that helps small businesses and to protect small businesses is something we call the Certificate of Competency Program. So the procurement's gone out for bid. Contractors have submitted their proposals or their bids. The evaluations have taken place by the contracting office and they've determined who they want, who they think is in line for the award of the contract. Once they get at that stage, the last thing the contracting officer must do, them, they must make a determination that the contractor is responsible. Um, and if they can't make that determination that they're responsible, 
then they have to refer the situation to the SBA. So they can't, so, they, so say that the company is the lowest priced, but they don't think they're responsible and they don't want to, they don't want to award the contract to them. Before they can just throw that contractor out, they must refer the whole uh, decision to the SBA for what we call a certificate of competency review. And this gives the opportunity for the small business to actually demonstrate that they are responsible and that they, they can in fact perform on the contract. Um, the, con the, contractor, the contractor will submit all the information they, the, the, the asked of them by the SBA to show that they are in fact a responsible contractor. And, and the referral with the contracting officer when they send it to the SBA can, base, can be based on capability, capacity, credit, integrity, tenacity, perseverance, or, or, or any of the above. So, so SBA actually has the, you know, the, the final say on whether or not a contractor is responsible. It's not their contracting officer. So, and while, while this process is being reviewed, the, the contract must be withheld, cannot be awarded. It generally takes the SBA 15 days to make this decision. If the SBA looks at the contractor and determines that they think the contractor is responsible, they will issue what's called a certificate of competency. And they will give that to the contracting officer. And that basically is a letter telling the contracting officer that you must award the contract to this company. And then the SBA after that will monitor the, the contractor's performance. Now I wanted to highlight this because right now, a lot, oftentimes we're, we're seeing a lot of procurements that go out as lowest price technically acceptable, LPTA. And so if a contractor gets to the point where they are the lowest priced, but the contracting officer wants to disqualify them for not being technically acceptable. Um, if that happens to you as a small business, make sure you see why they're calling you technically unacceptable. If they're making that call based on a element that is actually a responsibility element. Okay, remember I went through all the elements of responsibility, must have financial capability or ability to obtain and so on. If they throw you out for a responsibility issue, they can't do that without first going to the SBA for a, for a COC review. So if you're under an LPTA and you're determined to be the lowest price but not technically acceptable, make sure you look at that very closely and get involved with get, get the SBA involved very quickly because we may be able to help you with that before it gets before you get eliminated. Okay. <clears throat> Any questions? Okay, next, next slide. Okay, another program that helps protect the integrity of the whole system is the size program. Again, prior to award, after the bids have already come in, it's been determined by the contracting officer who should be getting the award. One last thing that the contracting officer must do, they must send out a notice to all the unsuccessful offerors, notifying them who the apparent awardee is, and give these other small businesses an opportunity to challenge the size of that apparent awardee. Of course, this will only be under small business set-asides. Under full and open competition, it doesn't come into play. But under a set-aside, if uh, you're, a, you're a contractor and, and you, you get notified that someone else is getting the award and you have reason to believe they are not a small business, you can file what we call a size protest to the contracting officer. You have to have reasonable uh, reasons you have to have you know they have to, you just can't have sour grapes and want to protest but you must have some facts some information that would lead you to believe that this company is not a small business and the small business size standards we talked about before is determined on on the size standard associated with each procurement so it could be different for each procurement some procurements are su su supply items generally speaking a supply item size standard is the number of employees of a company over the last 12 months. If it's a services or a construction type contract, it's based on your average annual receipts over the last five years. And so, uh, so those are the different size standards. So a company could be small for one procurement, but large for another procurement based on that. But anyway, if, if there is a size protest lodge, it goes to the contracting officer. They must stop everything immediately. They have to refer it. They have to send it off to the to the SBA, 
the SBA makes a size determination. They will gather all the information necessary to determine whether or not that company is actually a small business. They don't not only look at that small business, but they look at any companies that may be affiliated with that small business by common ownership, common management, or other means. And then we'll make a decision. Usually that decision is made within 15 days as well. That decision can be appealed to the Office of Hearings and Appeals, and that would be the final decision if, if that were, were to take place. Any questions on size program or size protests? Okay, next. Okay, um, we're just gonna talk real quickly about subcontractor assistance, what the SBA can do for, for you if you wanna be a subcontractor. Next slide. Just going to talk about these three elements today, small business subcontracting goals, subcontracting plans, and something called a commercial marketing representative. Okay, next slide. Okay, we talked earlier about prime contracting, small business goals. Well, the Small Business Act also establishes federal-wide statutory subcontracting goals. Okay, so a large business has won the contract. Now they must... Uh, they must submit a subcontracting plan, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. And these are the statutory goals uh, that the government has established, the Congress has established. You'll notice there isn't a goal for just regular small business, but there are for the socioeconomic categories. And those are the actual, actually the same federal goals that were for the, the federal contract level. And so um, go to the next slide. I think it'd be more beneficial to go to the next slide next. Okay, so. Here's when a subcontracting plan from a large business is required. Um, of course, they're never required when it's a small business set aside because it'd be a small business winning the award. But if a large business gets the award under a full open competition, they are required to submit a subcontracting plan at $1.5 million if it's a construction contract or $750,000 for all other types of contracts. This subcontracting plan, um, the large business must explain how they're going to subcontract, how much they're going to subcontract, who's their subcontract administrator. There's, there's 15 elements that must be involved, included in every subcontracting plan. The key one is how much, what percentages are they going to be subcontracting to each of the different types of small businesses and socioeconomic categories. Now this subcontracting plan is reviewed and approved by the contracting officer. But the contracting officer must receive um, advisory comments from the small business specialist of the agency and the SBA PCR. So I review a lot of subcontracting plans. And what we're looking for is to make sure that the goals that are established in that subcontracting plan are realistic and achievable for that specific contract. They may be higher or lower than those statutory goals that I showed you on the previous screen, but we want them to be realistic and make them stretch for the, for the contract that's actually going to be performed, okay? Now this plan, once it's been approved, is actually incorporated into the contract. It becomes part of the terms and conditions of the contract. And so if it's not adhered to, if, it, if, it, if there isn't uh, a good faith effort to try to accomplish those goals, there can be consequences to that large business prime contractor. Um, there are liquidated damages that can be assessed, penalties that can be assessed to a prime contractor that has, has goals, has a plan, and just throws them out the window and doesn't even try to, to comply with them. Um, large businesses quite often will receive performance reviews on their contract, a CPARS rating, uh, as performed on every large, large, large dollar contract. Those ratings can really help or hurt a contractor as far as receiving uh, future contracts because past performance will always be looked at on future contracts. And something that we're really pushing hard for is to make sure the past performance includes how well has that prime contractor done in achieving their small business goals. So this is one, one area that uh, large businesses are, are, are really looked at as far as how they're helping the small businesses. You can either help or hurt them with their, with their performance on the existing contract and also for future contracts. Okay, next slide. 
Okay, just one last thing I wanted to mention. We have what's called a commercial marketing representative. It's or a CMR. Uh, this person's kind of the counterpart to the, the PCR in my position. Their role is primarily to work with um, contracts after they've been awarded, whereas my role is to work with contracts, you know, acquisitions before award. Uh, and their role is to help large businesses to, uh, to help maximize them in their subcontracting to small businesses. Uh, they review and monitor the subcontracting program. They challenge uh, large businesses that aren't meeting their goals. They identify small business sources for the large business. They can also help small businesses identify large business, large businesses that need contract subcontracting opportunities. Uh, and they also provide training. And you can you can locate your CMR again on on the government website, the SBA website. Uh, region eight is the region I belong to. The, the the CMR her name is Sophia, and there's her her email, she'd be glad to hear from you and tell her that I sent you. She'll be happy to hear that as well. Any questions on that? I think we're about, we're about through here. Okay, next, next slide. I've just identified all the regulations that pretty much cover what I've talked about, about parity among the small businesses, the set-aside program, the set-aside and sole source program to the socioeconomic categories, all the joint venture regulations that uh, contractors should be aware of if they're going to do that. But my role is the certificate of competency size and the subcontracting plan roles. I believe that's all of my presentation. I'm really open to any, any discussion you want to have at this point. Thank you so much, Brent. Um, we have one more question from Alex. He asks, how can small businesses strategize for their participation or inclusion in a subcontracting plan. Over the years of a contract, can the acquisition require changes to the subcontracting goals? Okay, I'm not I'm not quite sure I understand that, Alex. So how Alex, yeah, read it again. Yeah, so, um, Alex here, hi, thank Alex. you, Brett. Yeah, hi, how you doing? Hey, so uh, what I meant is um, how would the small businesses um, strategize to participate. If, it, if there's a requirement out there, how do they strategize within the primes uh, that potentially are going to bid so they can be included okay. included in the subcontracting plan for that large prime? And then um, okay. the next it. question is over the years, or, or if you include it and the contract is awarded, over the length of that particular contract, can the government come back and say, change the um, subcontracting plan within, let's say there's a, a base plus five. Could, at, at any point of the base plus five, can the government come back and say, let's review the subcontracting plan or make changes to your subcontracting plan? Well, to answer that question, usually the subcontracting plan is good for the life of the contract. The goals are established for the basic contract uh, term as well as individual goals through each option year period. But usually there's only one, one plan per, per contract. But if the contract changes significantly, is modified, uh, then they can go in and revise their subcontracting plan to, to, you know, to accommodate for the, the additions to the, to the contract. Now, your first part, how do small businesses become aware? They have to market to the large businesses. Now, they can do that through contacting the CMR that I talked about. And, and she can help you find those large businesses that are look, looking for subcontracting plans. There's also different uh, websites out there where uh, it's called Subnet on the SBA website, where prime contractors looking for subcontractors will advertise for, for those. And, you, and also small businesses should be looking um, you know, on beta.sam whenever there's a requirement that goes out that you look and you sit and you go, you know, I, I can't be a large, I can't be a prime contractor on this, but I would very much, much be interested in being a subcontractor. They should market directly to large businesses that might they might think be going out for that, that contract. And quite often on the larger procurements, uh, the government will hold what's called an industry day or a pre-solicitation notice where all the interested parties will come and learn more about that specific acquisition. The government, it's, it's a government meeting that they, they want to provide information and get feedback on. Small businesses quite often will show up there so they can network 
with the large businesses that they know are going to be prime contractors. And that's where they have an opportunity to do that. So those are some of the things that I've seen over the years. Thank you. Hey, Brent, it's Jack down in Price, Utah. Hey, hey Jack, how are you? Good. How are you today? I'm good. Hey, can you review for me that uh, slide or that discussion you had about contracting officers notifying bidders of who got the job? When I had my small oh, sure. business, when I had my small business, uh, and I've also relayed this to some of my clients, uh, I never heard back from contracting officers, uh, even sometimes when I inquired as to who got the job. And when I get a question like that from my clients, I say, you won't hear unless you inquire, but they're required somehow to tell everybody that I didn't, I didn't get that yes. at all based on my yeah, experience. The, the, well, if, if it's a small business set aside, um, yes, they are required to notify all the un unsuccessful offers some way, uh, um, either by a letter or by posting it uh, on, on a website as to who the parent small business awardee is that that's required okay. and and the, and the language really is is to supposed to tell them you know you have five days to challenge the status of the small business you're supposed to give them that opportunity okay well i've been giving my clients the wrong information based on personal well, experience but I'll, well personal I'll, experience is you know you, you, you know the contracting officers are supposed to be doing that okay well, no, I, I appreciate the answer. I just needed to be, that reviewed for me. Thank you. Yeah, no, and, and um, that, that's good to know that, you know, if you can identify agencies that aren't doing that, the SBA will be all over that, by the way. We'll get on top of that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Brent, a quick question on uh, debriefing. When do you recommend that small businesses um, proceed to a, a requesting for a debriefing on a, a contract on which they had submitted, especially on RFP that they had submitted. Um, some feel a bit skittish to go forward thinking they could be penalized if, if they keep bothering a contracting officer. Um, what, what do you recommend after your years of experience? Well, you know, the, Contractors are allowed by, by the FAR, by the regulation, to, to be debriefed on, on an acquisition. Now, some solicitations, I, I actually seen some solicitations will kind of restrict that a little bit. They'll explain how they'll debrief you. But the FAR allows for all contractors to be debriefed on an acquisition if they, if they ask for it timely. So usually you have to ask for it within five days, or I can't remember for sure, I have to look it up, five or 10 days from when you've been notified that you're not the successful offer. If you re request the debriefing, you're, you're supposed to be given that debriefing. And the purpose is not to go in there and, and find out why you necessarily didn't get the contract over the award awarded firm. It's to find out how your proposal can be improved for the next acquisition. acquisition. Well, they, can, they can give you some guidelines on what, what, what they didn't see or what they would have liked to have seen in your proposal that would have helped it. Um, some small businesses go in there with the idea, or, or not, not just small, but mostly like large businesses will go into a, a debriefing with the idea that, hey, we should have got that contract and we're gonna find out what we have to find out about the one who did get it and, and how they mistreated us so that we can protest. And that's why some contractors are reluctant because they think, well, contracting officers are all, always on the defensive because they think they're, they're coming in here to find out what we can do to protest. And so they're gonna be kind of a little tight-lipped about it, but you no, know, that, that's, that's not the case. That's not the way it should be. It should be that you're going in there to really find out how you can improve your, your, your next proposal. So uh, in, in that sense, what kind of leading questions might be most appropriate? Oh, I, you know, I'd have to think about that one. It'd be, it'd depend on each solicitation. You, you know, you, you when, when you get your, uh, no notification, you know, you'd want, you'd want to go in and find out how you were rated in each, each of the categories and what you could do better in each of those. You know, just be open and frank, you know, just give open dialogue as to what, where you could have done better. Yeah, the PTAC can help you with that too. Marianne's got lots of experience with that as well. Thank, thank you.
Any other questions? I think that's I think that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Brett. And Alex, these slides, you know, are obviously available to anybody who wants them. Um, Great, thank you. Yeah. These will uh, be sent to all those that registered. Excellent. Well, if there are no further questions, um, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. Thank you again, Brent, for your time and for Marianne for setting this up. You're welcome. All right. Good luck, everybody. Appreciate working with you over the years. Thanks again, Brett.